Happy Father's Day. Like mothers, fathers are complicated. I, I know some of us had um, bright, shining daddy moments, like the moment caught on the front of your bulletin with this mm, smiling dad and two smiling children. And sometimes um, not. And um, I wanted to talk to you about some of our Unitarian forefathers who I think mostly were doing their best. But they were complicated too, like we are today. So really the sermon should be called... um, It has always been like this. I came to Unitarian Universalism in South Carolina. I'd never heard of it before because we don't like evangelizing and we're very shy and reserved. And so people who know about us don't know about us in time. Anyway, I don't have feelings about that. But um, (laughs) so I started being the minister at this Unitarian Church in South Carolina. And I asked about the history of the church and they said they'd had a big split during civil rights era. And the split had been about um, integrating the YMCA in the town. And everybody had wanted the YMCA integrated. The split was about how militant to be. Because some of the people felt like you should just kind of work gradually within the politics of the town to get it done. And other people felt that you should um, not really talk about politics in church. And other people felt that you should be disruptive and get it done by whatever means you needed to get it done because this was an abomination. And the people who were more, uh, I said, well, which group left? And the people calmly said, well, the people who wanted to agitate left. I think that's often what happens. But so Unitarians and Universalists have been working toward social justice forever. And I thought that we always had and we always did. And I thought, well, there really aren't any Unitarians who are against justice. (laughs) John C. Calhoun (laughs) was a United States representative, senator, secretary of war, secretary of state, and vice president to two presidents. He was the nemesis of John Quincy Adams. He was a son of South Carolina. There are big statues to him in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, he was best known for those rallying cries of states' rights, which means states' rights to enslave men and women. Um, States' rights and nullification, which means (laughs) if our state doesn't agree with a federal law, we don't have to practice it. And I think um, many southern states still have that idea. Every now and then they have to send in the National Guard, although Uh, That hasn't been done in a while. He was raised by Scottish Calvinists and uh, kept that work ethic and that distrust of pleasure through it his whole life. He didn't approve of dancing and he was far from a foodie, but he had gone to Yale and gotten influenced by the Unitarian thinking. And so he became a Unitarian. So boy, when I found out John C. Calhoun was a Unitarian, I had to stop in my tracks for a moment. After graduation to briefly study law in Charleston, he went back up north to Connecticut to the Litchfield School of Law. Connecticut is a hotbed of racism. Don't know if you knew that. Litchfield was a place where anti-federalist thought and secessionist politics were uh, sweeping through the student body. 
He moved back to South Carolina as a gentleman farmer, which meant in plain terms, he bought a lot of land, named it Fort Hill, made a plantation, which means that enslaved men and women were working in the fields and running the household. Many Southern Unitarians were against the enslavement of men and women, but they were against it in different degrees. The American Unitarian Association in Boston sent a minister, a preacher down to Savannah to talk to them about the AUA's stance on slavery and they not only did not let him into their pulpit, they sent him packing back to Boston and said, don't y'all send anybody else down here. We do not, here's a quote from John McCauley's uh, Unitarianism in the Antebellum South, we do not want to sully the purity of our religion with politics. One of the Unitarians who wanted badly to keep the union together because the union was being threatened by various states being added to it and the big battles about whether they would be sl slave states or non-slave states. Everybody was um, fighting. They did not fight sweetly, of course. In the US uh, Senate and House of Representatives, they had a standing decision that they would not debate the issue. And John Quincy Adams kept fighting to let it be debated. But it was threatening to tear the Union apart and South Carolina, uh, the governor was talking about seceding. And the president at the time was a Unitarian named Millard Fillmore. President Fillmore succeeded to the presidency at the death of Zachary Taylor. He was, he was an honest and true fellow, a person who wanted to do his best. And he did not want to identify with either of the groups. He was a compromiser. And uh, Henry Clay had suggested, he was a guy from uh, Kentucky, had suggested a compromise about the slave states. And they were going to let certain states be uh, non-slave states if they would make the fugitive slave law, not only that uh, slave catchers from the South could go north and catch the men and women who had escaped, but that the law would be toughened, zero tolerance, so that any northerner who knowingly harbored a slave or helped would be also arrested and charged. Taylor, I mean, President Fillmore did not uh, want to sign that bill. And yet, he wanted the union and he made what most of us think is a terrible mistake. He vowed that he wanted, quote, to look upon this whole country from the farthest coast of Maine to the utmost limit of Texas as one country. He delayed signing the act for three days until September 18th, 19, 1850. He pondered its implications. He knew it would be hated by abolitionists and he knew that it would destroy his political career. But the union was what he felt was most important and he was doing his best. He had sworn an oath to defend and preserve the union. So he signed it. Senator Charles Sumner campaigned immediately for the repeal of the act in the Senate and he said, better for Fillmore had he never been born 
better for his memory and the good name of his children had he never been president. That pretty much stuck to him. The governor of South Carolina still was threatening secession, but Fillmore sent some federal troops down there and the governor subsided. Fillmore never doubted that he'd taken the right action, really until the end. He said, and this is a person who is a good person, going wrong in the kindest way possible. God knows that I detest slavery, but it is an existing evil for which we are not responsible. Can you imagine? And we must endure it and give it such protection as is guaranteed by the Constitution till we can get rid of it without destroying the last hope of free government in the world. He thought if he didn't sign that thing, it would have destroyed the country, but it just postponed the horror, as his minister in Buffalo would say. He was uh, attending the Unitarian Church of Buffalo for the 35 years. And a lot of people in the congregation disagreed with what he had done, and he didn't complain when they complained to him. Oh. The minister uh, said, I'm looking for the beginning of his quotation here. He dreaded war by any and every means he could save his country from such calamity as war would bring. When Congress, by a large majority, passed the Fugitive Slave Bill, then for the sake of peace, he thought it best to sign it. Now all can see, and some saw it then, it was only postponing the harbor. But I know Mr. Fillmore was honest, unspotted by corruption, and never thought of the nation's capital as a place to make money or satisfy selfish ambition. No goods of the nation clung to him. His hands were clean. Integrity and economy kept him safe. Our, one of our greatest historians of the Unitarian and Universalist movements is named Conrad Wright, and he wrote in his, uh, one of his histories of Unitarianism that the Unitarians were mostly in three different camps about abolition. There was the William Lloyd Garrison camp, greatly influenced by Lydia Marie Child and her writings. She wrote an appeal in favor of that class of Americans called Africans. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison acted for the immediate cessation of slavery. Uh, he was up there in New York and met often with uh, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass and all of those people who were working on abolition at the time. Then, so there were the Garrison folks and then there were the people who sought a gradual end to the institution of slavery so as to minimize the disruption of the social, economic, and political order. This is one of the things that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about from the Birmingham jail is how uh, liberals, white liberals, love order and value order. And anything that's going to upset order is upsetting to those people. And then there were people who did not like slavery on, a, on moral grounds, but they didn't want to make a political statement about it. You can see those three groups today in issues of Black Lives Matter, in issues of immigration policy, in almost every uh, issue that the Unitarian Universalist Association takes on, there are people who say, we need to get this done right away. Mm. Marriage equality was like that. We need to get this done right away. And other people were like, no, no, you're going to make people mad. We need to do it gradually. And other people were like, no, justice delayed is justice denied. We need to have it right now. And then there were the gradual, don't make trouble, people. 
And then there were the people who were like, yeah, I have my doubts about it too. I guess gay people should get married, but I don't know. Um, some of the long-time abolitionists, though, felt that they had worked really, really hard. They had talked and talked and talked and talked. They had been uninvited to many dinner parties because that's all they wanted to talk about because it's urgent. Like when you have children being ripped from their families at the border, really, there are people on Facebook who are going, how are we talking about anything else? Good question. I don't know. Um, the abolitionists were like that. Everybody said, oh, they're so boring. They only talk about one thing. There was a group of six men, two of whom were wealthy, two of whom were Unitarian ministers, not the wealthy ones, um, and two other people, uh, people of influence. So six people of influence, two people of wealth, banded together, talked, met over and over again. They met with Frederick Douglass. They met with each other. They talked about what could be done, what should be done. And they were in despair about how anything could change without violence. And so they decided that maybe violence was the only way. These six met with John Brown, who was an abolitionist who believed in uh, shedding blood, that that was the only way the institution of slavery was going to end. It was not going to come to a natural end. It was not going to have a quiet, gradual, sweet death. It was going to need to be killed. And so they funded the raid on Harper's Ferry, where John Brown raided the Harper's Ferry um, armory to get arms to arm uh, enslaved men so that they could have a slave rebellion. But he was caught and tried. And the New York Times broke the news about the Secret Six, who had funded his uh, efforts. Now, one of the Unitarian ministers was named Thomas Higginson, and the other was Theodore Parker, a much more famous Unitarian minister. Theodore Parker had already gone to Italy. He was hanging out with uh, Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh, he needed to get his uh, tuberculosis healed, and when the police came knocking at the rest of the guy's doors, he was in Italy. Three of them um, fled to Canada. One uh, stayed on and kept trying to get John Brown out of jail. Um, and one of them committed himself to an insane asylum, which is what they called it then, uh, saying that he hadn't had anything to do with it. Before he got captured, John Brown had killed a lot of people. I guess he was doing what he thought was best as well. So we have quite a heritage, a heritage of all different positions being held by people who uh, were of our faith tradition. I guess what I want to say is, it is understandable that some among us feel urgency and a need to mm, create disturbance and noise for justice. And we need those among us. And there are those among us who want to put their foot on the gas pedal, but not all the way to the floor, and handle things in a politically acceptable way. And there are people who are uncomfortable with all this justice, justice stuff from the pulpit. It has always been this way. And we need us all. That is what I believe right now. In every social justice movement, there are radicals who are scary, and there are middle-of-the-roaders 
who the powers that be feel they can deal with. There's always a Martin Luther King Jr. who was radical in his way, but there's a Malcolm X who was scarier. In the women's suffrage movement, there were both kinds of women as well. Um, respectable women who wore their hats and hat pins and wild women who chained themselves to Woodrow Wilson's fence outside the White House and had to be forcibly fed in prison, tortured. It takes both kinds. It takes both. Unitarian Universalism, both Unitarianism and Universalism have always been about justice. We do our best to carry on that tradition and we do our best to have conversation with those who are in a different position from us, who have come to different conclusions than the ones we have come to. We do our best to disagree kindly with respect and curiosity and ask questions and not what in the world is wrong with you, not a question that we want to ask. Tell me how you came to this position. Help me understand. Those are the questions we want to ask. May it be so. And now let us sing together hymn number 1064 in the turquoise hymnal, Blue Boat Home. <laughs> 